Well, hello and good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you on this lovely, balmy July 16th. Welcome to the Arizona History Happy Hour. And do we have a fun show for you tonight? So, again, I want to welcome you all here as we get ready for an adventure. Now, we started doing this um, 13 weeks ago as just a way to keep sharing and exploring Arizona in this time where we're all kind of not going much of anywhere. And so we figured it was a great time to sit around and just kind of reflect on Arizona and start telling some of those really amazing stories about this place that we're in and all the stuff that truly makes it such a unique place. So thank you again for being here. Now, this is only made possible through sponsorship from folks like you. Um, if you take a look at the very top, you will see my Venmo account. So if you'd like to throw a few little things my way, I would appreciate it. Um, also, I do have a sponsor with ARP Arizona. Now, the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we're not alone. ARP is here in Phoenix, providing information that can help you and your family. Now, if you'd like more information, you can go to their website, which is www.aarp.org slash AZ for Arizona. Now, well, we do a lot of different things during the next hour. So we have some trivia coming up. We have a special guest, as well as we'll explore a small town in Arizona, Little Arizona, as well as some Arizona music history and something from my own collection. Because, you know, I've got shelves full of stuff. I thought, you know, what a fun time to start talking about it. And again, talking about different things here in Arizona. So my name is Marshall Short. I am your host this evening. I am also known as the Hip Historian. Now you might wonder, how does one get a name like the Hip Historian? Well, you know, a little over 20 years ago, I was working in a library in Brooklyn, and it was the middle of winter. It was snowing, and I had had my fill, and so it was time for a change. So we loaded up everything we own into a big orange cube, a U-Haul. And you know, their international world headquarters are right here in the Valley of the Sun. Developed back in the 50s when they moved here and realized how much of an issue it was. So they started a company to help all those folks moving across the country. Now we moved and promptly moved into a 1956 ranch. Now when we bought it, it was beige on beige on beige. And I think there was yet another layer of beige just to annoy me. I'm happy to say now that it is a lovely seafoam and cantaloupe. Now it's a lovely 1956 ranch house. And there's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, the push buttons for the stove set in the wall and a matching yellow in the wall oven. Now, if you look at that oven, you'll notice that there's a few, th well, at least there's one big thing missing in the door. It's a window. So that way, if you're baking something, you wanna check on it. Well, not that, well, outside is baking. We're not baking inside anymore. Josh and I were just talking about, <laughs> no one's turning on their oven right now. It's a little toasty to be doing that. But back when I was baking, it's like, if you wanna check on something, you'd have to so carefully open but even more gingerly shut that door because if you let it slam, whatever you're making would just deflate and nobody would enjoy that. 
Now, as soon as I moved here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history here. But I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, I came face to face with so many amazing stories about people, places, and things. And then there's that post-war boom that I think in a lot of ways made the Arizona that we know and love today. All those GIs that either were stationed here, were trained here, or passed through on their way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers. And in some cases, looking for houses just like mine. And then there's this man, Dr. Carrier, the inventor of air conditioning. Because without him, none of us would be smiling today or yesterday, or tomorrow, without that little thing called air conditioning. Also, the Phoenix New Times has named me best historian several years in a row, as well as Phoenix Magazine named me this best bespectacled Phoenix celebrity because I do indeed like my eyewear. Now, not that this is a really great venue to see that in, but what is Marshall wearing? Because I have my own idea of what I think looks good. And for me, everything's got a story. And, you know, a lot of times people think, well, you know, I just have my, my own idea of what looks good. And for me, everything has a story. So you might remember every February 14th, we do a celebration for ourselves for Statehood Day. And... Back in 2012, we had one heck of a celebration across the state. And they did events, not just in outlying towns, but right here in downtown, right in front of the old Capitol. They had a main stage with a variety of performers doing things. And someone gave me 15 minutes to talk about anything I wanted to. And I chose to talk about one of the most favorite events that hardly anybody remembers. It was started back in 1926 by Charlotte Hull. Now, if you're ever up in Prescott, you can go visit her house, which is now turned into a museum. She was also our first poet laureate. The event was called Mask of the Yellow Moon. It ran from 1926 to 1955. At its height, it had about 5,000 high school and college students performing in it. It started off here in the Elgin Shriners Temple, which is just down the street from the Capitol. It then moved to Montgomery Stadium, which was our very first stadium right here in Arizona. And it was home to also our very first bowl game. And it was the Salad Bowl. I sure wish we'd bring that back because I'm sure it would make bowl day a lot more fun to be able to have a healthy salad instead of lots of deep fried Michigas. And what would you expect from the salad bowl? Why none other than the queen of the salad bowl riding in her very own float that looks like a salad bowl. It even has a spoon and fork to serve from. Now, the Mask of Yellow Moon was based on a legend about how the god of sun would give his rays to make the earth golden and warm and make things grow. So it was always a springtime event. And you had pretty much all the high schools in Phoenix involved with it. So they had quite a collection of folks. You And it was woven through the curriculum of almost everything. You had skits being done by the debate club. You had multiple marching bands and really large sets. In fact, I've got a story from a guy, him and his friends would go steal a little bit of that set when the show was done, drag it to his carriage house, and they would put on plays throughout the rest of the year in front of that little bit of stolen set. It was also famous for lots of young women out dancing on the field. Now, they were also wearing amazing costumes designed by students and made by home ec. And so I was lucky enough to find a few dresses in a box and I was allowed to borrow those for 24 hours. So the clock was ticking. I mean, this little, this is late thirties, a little Aztec inspired dance costume. And I was able to convince three lovely friends to put those outfits on. Now you're all three of those are from the late thirties. Now, if any of you know me, you know I'm not a very good wallflower and that I needed something that would stand up to those amazing dresses. 
so I started talking to friends and realized Glenn should be involved. So Glenn was a sign designer when he rolled in town in the early 50s, and he designed a myriad of signs. But here he is actually getting an award last year from the Arizona Sign Association. He is now in their Hall of Fame. One of his probably most famous signs that everyone knows is the My Florist sign there over on 7th Avenue in McDowell. He did a slew of others, such as the Mr. Lucky sign. And so the jacket that he painted was an homage to the Arizona state flag. And I think he did a heck of a job. You know, it then got me going on, well, you know, why just stop at one suit coat based on an Arizona theme when I can have a whole slew of other jackets? So I'm up to, I think, seven jackets and actually working on the next couple as we speak. I think one of the, I think the next one may actually be a black velvet painting jacket. Now, one of the reasons why I always like to tell this story is because you never know where the next piece of a story is coming from. And so it also emphasizes the fact that some of my best stuff comes from people because they remember things or they'll connect dots where a newspaper article might not do it or talk about other things. And so I was doing a presentation for a group called the Arizona's First Families. Now to be a member of that group, you have to be able to prove your lineage back to pre-statehood. So when I was done talking, um, this woman, Norma, came over and tapped me on the shoulder and said, let's go out to my car. And so we go out and she pulls this dress out that is covered with flowers and butterflies. This was her mother's dress that she wore in the Mask of the Yellow Moon. And she also had programs from 1928 or 29. And so she also, with those programs, you know, at that moment, the librarian in me kicked in. And because I didn't have on my gloves, I didn't want to touch those programs, but I look forward to getting another shot at them when I can safely touch them and find out exactly what dress, I mean, what number this was worn for and what year. I mean, for being from the late 20s, it's in spectacular condition still. And, you know, it is Arizona History Happy Hour. So, of course, it requires a cocktail. And uh, let's see. Alrighty. So, and because of it being hot outside, I thought I would get a cocktail that reflects that. And so, it's called Something Sinister. So, using... Oh, let me click on... my little bar over here. So we are going to do, let's see, two ounces of, this stuff is really good. Um, it is St. George green chili vodka. I have to say it's quite tasty. Um, I saw people were using it in a lot of like Bloody Marys, but I think it'll be really delicious with just a little bit of, and then we'll throw in some lime juice, and then a little bit of mango puree. There we go. We'll throw in a little bit of ice. And yes, I did wash my hands. And then of course I have to have some Hello Kitty involved somewhere. So I'm using my Hello Kitty chopsticks to stir my cocktail up. So, all right. So cheers. Oh my gosh, that is really good. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting to be that good. All right. So our next segment is from the my histo cam. So let's see. Let's actually. All right. So this is an ashtray from Googie's Coffee Shop. 
Now, you know, feel free to let me know if you ever went to one. They had a slew of them across the valley. Now, they started off back in 1957 over at Park Central Mall. They were one of the first shops to open up there. Now, it was, um, it was run by the family Gugisberg. And one of the things I think is interesting, so it was like, the name of the restaurant was Googie's. They started off at Park Central, and so they wound up being a coffee shop with lots of amazing baked goods. And what I think is funny is their logo of the baker holding the little banner. It says Googie, Googie's, but spelled completely different than the name of the restaurant. So not quite sure what's up with that. Now, it's also at a time where there was an architecture style called Googie, which they it does play on that a little bit. Um, now, they also ran a restaurant called Los Olivos down on McDowell. And so, of course, with all their ads, they say, hey, you know, don't forget about our coffee shop just up the street. Now, they had a slew of these across the valley. Now, they started at Park Central, and they grew until they also had ones out in Scottsdale and Mesa, Tempe, kind of all over the place. By the 90s, they were all, they were pretty much all shut down. Now, they were famous for, they had a pink champagne cake that no one has been able to perfect the recipe. There have been lots of folks in the Valley attempting to mimic that recipe, but as far as I was able to find, no one got it right. Uh, at one point, they opened up a pie restaurant where it sounds like they just did coffee and pie. So there was a wide variety of things you could do there. And so now it is just a memory. So let me know if you ever went to a Googie's and which one you went to. So again, I want to thank you all for being here because without you, we wouldn't be doing this. Otherwise, well, I'd be doing this all by myself and it's nowhere near as much fun sitting at home talking to yourself when you can talk to other people. And so through the miracle of modern technology, yes, indeed, we have a very special guest this evening. And it is Josh from the Tempe History Museum. Well, hello, Marshall. Hello and welcome. Thank you for being on. Absolutely. It's good to be here. You know, I just watched you make that delicious looking cocktail. That looked really great. You know, wish I had one of those in front of me right now. You know, I wasn't quite expecting it to, I mean, the heat of, actually the vodka is quite, got a little bit of spice to it. Yeah, I was picturing really the spice well. that chili going with the sweetness of the mango being really nice. So I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to save that one and try it in the future. I know. I'm like, wow. I think I may have found myself a little new summer cocktail. <laughs> a new fave, yeah. Indeed. All right. So you are at the Tempe History Museum. So tell us a little bit about the museum. Right. So I work at the Tempe History Museum. I'm the curator of collections here. Uh, we're a community history museum all about the city of Tempe. Um, we've got, uh, for normal times, uh, great uh, changing exhibits and permanent exhibits. Uh, we have a whole variety of programs for kids and adults. Uh, we have a very popular performance program uh, where we have live bands. And then my role being the uh, collections curator is to um, collect and care for all the great pieces of history of Tempe. And so we have here at the museum uh, archives with about 60,000 historic photographs of Tempe, um, a collection with maybe 15, 16,000 uh, artifacts relating to Tempe, uh, and then uh, multiple other uh, maps, references, um, correspondence, uh, everything for all your Tempe history research needs. Um, whole collection is also digitized and searchable online too. So that's something that you can find on our website. And so uh, we really like getting our information out there. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. I grew up in Tempe. It's my town. I really like working at the museum that represents my town and is part of my history too. So, so what is that behind you? Uh, so I am talking to you from the, uh, the gallery of the Tampa History Museum. I wanted to try to bring everybody in here virtually a little bit, uh, as much as I could. Um, but I'm, I'm here in front of the, uh, the first Tempe fire truck. This is a, a 1919 Ford fire truck, uh, the first one purchased by the department. 
Um, it was uh, actually a volunteer fire department back in those days, and this is this is what the uh, those guys those guys used back in the day. Um, but it's uh, on permanent display here at the museum, and it's in excellent condition. We're really happy to have it. Move my head a little bit so you can see it. And actually, let's <laughs> yeah, actually let me click on a button so we can get a better shot of that. I think there we go, so we people can see it a little bit better. See, look yeah, at a... understanding what my buttons do. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that it's is a so beauty. Cool. Yeah, look at that thing. Wow. You said that's 1919? It's 1919. Yeah, it's a Ford. Uh, before they had this, they used to have just a, uh, a kind of a pull cart. So when they went to a fire, they would have to grab a cart with hoses and things and just sort of run and pull it to the <laughs> fire. So this was a big step up for the department in 1919 when they got this thing. Um, but yeah, it's beautiful. The fire department, they kept it in great shape for many, many years. When it went out of service, they started using it in local parades and out at events and stuff like that, uh, all the way up until 1972 when the museum was established. And then it became part of our collection, and we've had it ever since. Wow, that's really super cool. All right, yep, now so one, of the, one of the many cool things we have here at the museum. Oh, and indeed, I know you guys. Well, we'll talk. I'm sure there'll be a couple exhibits pop up as we go through our trivia. So, yeah, I mean, so one of the things we always do as part of the Arizona History Hour is we do trivia, and so with that, it's a moment where we actually it's more educational than it is about pointing and saying, oh, you don't know the answer because we have 10 questions today. And what we'll do is go through those 10 questions. They're all multiple choice. And so at the end, we'll take a little break as people relax and then we will launch in and talk about the answers to those questions. So who knows what stories are going to come out. So it's going to be really fun because I'm sure a lot of you out there, I know some of the questions I'm sure will be met with lots of exclamation of positive things. And so, and that's part of the reason I'm doing a multiple choice so that way, even if you don't know the answer, you can still take a guess and have a really good shot of getting it right. And by the end of this, you will know <laughs> My friend Preston is going C, 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 C. So I don't know if that works, this trivia. So, all right. So now what you can do is if you want to, you can type it here in the chat. You can keep track of it on a pen and paper near you. Whatever floats your boat, it's all good. All right. So our very first question, number one. Tempe was named after a fertile river valley in what country? A, was it Greece? B, Italy? C, Spain? Or D, Romania? Tempe was named for a river valley in what country? It's one of those. All right, question two. ASU has used the Sun Devil as their mascot since 1946. What was their mascot before that? Was it A, owls, B, panthers, C, bulldogs, or D, buffaloes? What was an earlier mascot rather than the Sun Devil for ASU? Ah, I can already hear the people screaming. <laughs> what was the name of the Tempe attraction that took its inspiration from Disneyland? A, was it Kitty Land? B, Fiddlesticks? C, Castles and Coasters? Or D, Legend City? Which one of those attractions was in Tempe and took its inspiration from Disneyland? <laughs> Indeed, some people are already getting very excited without, I can almost hear Cindy yelling right now. <laughs> All right, question four. Von K. Van Dyke won the Miss America crown in 1965. What was her talent for the competition? Was it A, 
ventriloquism, B, magic, C, pantomime, or D, hula hoop. Oh, and I think they would have just come out then. So, oh, it could have easily have been a hula hoop. All right, so we're at the halfway point, question five. What movie filmed in Tempe used real Tempe police cars and police uniforms as props? Was it A, Bill and Tid's Excellent Adventure? Was it B, Raising Arizona? C, Jerry Maguire? Or D, Just One of the Guys? Which one of those movies filmed in Tempe used police cars and police uniforms as props? All right, so sliding into home base with question six. What Tempe restaurant was among the very first Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises in the nation? Was that restaurant named Monty's La Casa Vieja? B, Minder Binders? C, Harmon's Ranch? Or D, Dash Inn? Which one of those restaurants was one of the very first KFCs in the entire country? All right, question seven. What country music star launched his solo career from DJ's nightclub in Tempe? Was it A, Hank Williams Jr., B, Merle Haggard, C, Johnny Paycheck, or D, Waylon Jennings? Which one of those musicians launched their solo career at JD's nightclub in Tempe? What was the name of the Tempe Barrio that was once located in the area where Sun Devil Stadium is today? A, San Pablo, B, San Miguel, C, Hermosa Nuevo, or D, El Norteño? Which one of those was what they called the Barrio in Tempe? All right, we're almost to the end. Second to the last question. What Tempe attraction was the first of its kind in the U.S. and I think even the world, I would guess to say? A, Tempe Town Lake. B, Kiwanis Park. C, Big Surf. Or D, Gamage Auditorium. What Tempe attraction was the first of its kind in the U.S.? It was one of those amazing attractions. And our last question for the evening, what was the name of the largest video game arcade in Tempe in the 80s? A, Sparky's Den. B, Starship Fantasy. C, Pinball Wizard, or D, The Black Hole. What was the name of the largest video game arcade in Tempe back in the 80s? Where kids could lose lots of quarters <laughs> and lots of time. Not like I ever did that. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and parents could lose their children, too. <laughs> uh, yes, or at least they knew where they'd be. <laughs> yeah, it's like a babysitter, right? Exactly. All right. So while everyone is getting their answers ready, let's take a little dive into some Arizona music history. And because we're talking about Tempe, I thought we should talk about a music group, the Jetsons. Now, what I love about them is they started off actually being formed back in 1981 after the demise of a punk group called Billy Clone and the Same. So Bruce, bassist Damon, they brought on keyboardist Brad, and then their drummer Steve, and that's what formed the Jetsons. Now this band was 
in the early 80s, and it was really just as that tempi sound was really becoming established and becoming something unique in the country. And so probably one of the most famous bands that came out of that is probably the Gin Blossoms, which some of you might know, and maybe even had listened to today, who knows? And so I thought it was funny that um, one of the Gin Blossoms had made a comment at one point about how even though they were selling millions of records, the Jetsons thought he was in a good band that was right up there with them. So he thought that was much more of an important badge of honor than selling all those records. Oh my gosh, Jay my friend Jason saw the Jetsons at the Mason Jar That's cool. back in yeah. the day. That would have been an amazing venue to see them. Wow. <laughs> I know the Jetsons, they played a lot at uh, the Devil House, if anybody remembers that place. It was up on Rural Road, uh, later became Club Rio, but that was a, a common venue for the Jetsons. And also a place called Merlin's, which was uh, in Denel Plaza, right by where where the Yucca Tap Room is uh, on, uh, the, on Mill Avenue in Tempe. Uh, both of those were sort of home bases for the Jetsons, but they uh, really built a big local following. And, and like you say, Marshall, I mean, I, I feel like they really laid the groundwork uh, for the Tempe music scene that then became very famous a few years later with the Jim Blossoms and all the, the, the bands in the alternative Mill Avenue sound. Indeed. And if you think you haven't heard their music, and if you've been watching Stranger Things, they actually had one of their songs, When the Sun Goes Down, that was in episode 205. And that was, there is a local group called Fervor Records. And so they are doing a really amazing job of really trying to find new placement for some of that music history so that it stays around and in people's ears instead of just going away and being forgotten about. I love that work, you know, because the Jetsons, I mean, they're a new wave band from the early 80s. They really sound like the era. And so plugging that into a show like Stranger Things, it just takes you back to, you know, 1983. It's perfect. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, as I was getting ready for today, I had the Jetsons on playing and I was like, <laughs> my gosh, you know, I would love to have seen them in concert. Now, Marshall, I want to show you this. I did grab oh. my Jetsons record to bring out for you today. So wow. This is, a, this is their official recording, their vinyl release. Uh, it's interesting to note that this was produced by Mike Candelo, who's very important to uh, Arizona music. Oh, wow. So he's the one who uh, produced and engineered this thing. But it's a great record. If everybody, if anybody ever sees this at Zia Records or in a bin somewhere, definitely pick it up. You won't be sorry. It's a great piece of local music history. Indeed it is. All right. So everyone get your answers ready because here they come. So, and I'm actually really glad you found a photo of, <laughs> of what the fertile river valley looks like because everyone's always like, it's like, really? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I actually did have one. Yeah, so, uh, so the Vale of Tempe, it's a, a river valley in Greece that's near Mount Olympus and it features into uh, stories in Greek mythology. And so it's thought that the, uh, the name given to the Arizona Temp uh, Tempe came from Daryl Dupa, who was a early settler in the Phoenix area you know, he was a classically trained, Cambridge-educated, ed supposedly uh, man who was out here in the very early days. And he's the one who's credited for naming Phoenix, which, of course, is also a, a reference to Greek mythology. It's a mythological creature, the firebird that rises from the, uh, the ashes and is reborn. And so he also named Tempe as being evocative of this fertile river valley in Greece. And early on, it was really more of a regional name. They used Tempe to explain kind of the south side of the, uh, the Salt River. Mm. And the town itself was called Hayden's Ferry, um, which was appropriate because uh, Charles Trumbull Hayden, who was a town founder, uh, besides running a flour mill, he had a ferry that uh, took people back and forth across the Salt River during high water. Uh, but there already was a town in Arizona called Hayden, and the United States Post Office didn't want to deliver to Hayden and Hayden's Ferry in Arizona, and they made us pick another name. And so since Tempe was already kicking around, we, we grabbed that one as our town name, and, and we've been Tempe ever since. Wow. All right, question two. So, af so they've been using the Sun Devil, ASU has, since the mid-40s. What was their mascot before that? Yeah, so... 
go Bulldogs, everybody. So I, I love this picture that's here. So this is this is from our collection. It's a, a, probably from the 1930s. It's a baseball a jersey worn by the, the Bulldogs at Arizona State College, uh, which is what it was called back in those days. Um, but yeah, we were, we were the Bulldogs for a while, but nobody seemed to really like it. It was kind of a generic name. It was used by a lot of other schools. And there was kind of a push to come up with something uh, unique and that reflected the desert environment. And so they ended up making up a thing called the Sun Devil and they put it to a vote to the student body in 1946 and um, it, uh, it passed um, uh, very overwhelmingly and we've been Sun Devils ever since. Uh, but I do want to say some of you may have picked owls for your answer. Um, if you did, you maybe get just a tiny bit of partial credit because that is, um, is something that people think um, that Early on, the, the sports teams may have used the owl as sort of an informal mascot. And a lot of that comes from a old 1899 photograph of the football team posing with an owl on a leash as if it was a pet or possibly a little mascot for them. Uh, but the team was never officially called the owls. Back in the early days, they were the normals after the territorial normal school. Then we became the bulldogs and then the sun devils. So. Uh, I kind of like normals. Maybe we should go back to that. I go, know. Go normals, like, everybody. What would that look like today? It's like, I mean, <laughs> we'd all have unkept hair. Right. There's the normals <laughs> and then there's the abnormals. <laughs> right. Ex exactly. All right. What was the name of the Tempe attraction that took its inspiration from Disneyland? So, yeah, I know a lot of you know this one, but I love talking about Legend City. So, uh, it did open in 1963, and I think it's interesting that it really was directly modeled off of Disneyland. You know, Disneyland just opened a few years prior. I think it was in 1957. And uh, uh, Legend City, it was dreamed up by a man named Lewis Crandall. Um, and really what he did was he went and he hired a lot of the Disneyland crew, a lot of the architects and the builders who created Disneyland, and he brought them to Arizona to make another one. And it has a lot of the same features. You know, Legend City had dark rides with animatronics. It had a lake. It had a train that went all the way around the perimeter. It had a marching band. Um, a lot of the things that we really think about with Disneyland, uh, they really recreated here. Um, but Legend City was on Washington Street uh, near uh, Priest. Um, right on the Tempe and Phoenix border. Um, although on the Tempe side, a lot of people think it was in Phoenix, but no, us Tempe people will fight you about that. It was definitely in Tempe. Uh, and it lasted until uh, 1983. Uh, so that's when the park closed and SRP ended up acquiring the whole thing and uh, using the land to build uh, uh, offices and things. And so that's what you see now if you go by the old Legend City site, it's, a, it's an office complex. And then I always hear rumors about how um, different folks went to the auction where they started auctioning off the stuff from Legend City. And so like somebody has one of the cars from where you could get it and drive in a garage somewhere. Lamp post of it are still around town. So it's if true. I've, I've seen pieces of it, bits and pieces of it here and there and uh, going around. You know, they used to have a, a, a sky ride, like a gondola that would dangle people and take them, you know, over the park on a, on a cable. And you see those sky ride bubbles around here and there sometimes. People, people collected those and, you know, the hardcore collectors collected them and they saved pieces of Legend City. So, yeah, it's yep. fun. There's, you know, so, so many years later, there's still pieces of it floating around. That's right. When the, when the museum did their exhibit, didn't you guys have one of the gondolas? Yeah, yeah, we did. So a few years ago, we did do a great exhibit about Legend City. Uh, and we went out and we, we collected as many uh, pieces of the park as we could. And, and we did have one of the gondolas that we had set up for people to ride in uh, or to sit in, I guess. Uh, right. Then we also had we also had one of the old fashioned cars that people would drive on the car ride. And um, we uh, 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 had some of the uniforms that the staff would wear. You know, the staff would wear themed uniforms depending on what ride they would operate. And so we had that and we had one of the marching band uniforms. Um, it, it was a lot of fun. It was one of my favorite projects we've ever done here. And it showed. I mean, there was so much fun stuff. Yeah, it was great. That one felt really good. All right. Vonda K. Van Dyke won the Miss America crown in 1965. What was her talent for the competition? Yeah, so Vonda K. Van Dyke was Tempe's own Miss America, and she was and still is a very talented ventriloquist. So uh, really she started this act as a feature performer at Legend City. Uh, she had a show at the, the Golden Palace Saloon, they called it, which was their entertainment venue there in Legend City. And she did this ventriloquism act. And so when she made it to 
the Miss America stage, she really just did her old Legend City act and charmed the judges in America and ended up uh, winning the whole thing. Um, but I want you to notice that the, the dummy that's there with her, so that's Curly Q, that's his name. And I got to know him pretty well. So back when we did our Legend City exhibit, uh, Vonda was kind enough to lend us Curly Q uh, along with her Miss America dress and her uh, winter sash. Uh, but we were able to bring a curly cute here and set them up in a in a display and um i have to admit that i did put my hand up inside him and I, I found the little levers that moved his little eyeballs back and forth and so i've always wondered how those things work and so i was able to uh, to try it out on a very notable puppet i mean i would have done the exact same thing <laughs> wouldn't you like how can you resist although yeah. i was wearing gloves i'm not a monster <laughs> <laughs> And it wasn't even in this current time. So, <laughs> so, and then she also did, she would go around and do high schools talking about auto safety using Curly Q with a local policeman. And I think somewhere I actually have film footage of that, which I've never seen, but I was told when I bought it, it was actually from that, from the policeman who's like, yeah, this is basically Vonda K. Van Dyke doing her ventriloquism act for a high school. Oh man, I'd love to see that. I mean, yeah, she, she really did become, her and Curly Q both really did become celebrities for their time. And so they went around and they made all kinds of appearances, endorsements, and, and you, would, you would see her around a lot um, during that time. All right, and here we are at question five. What movie filmed in Tempe used real Tempe police cars and police uniforms as props? So all the movies that were there on our list were filmed in Tempe, but uh, Raising Arizona is the one that had a, a special relationship with the Tempe Police Department. Uh, so the movie came out in 1987. It starred uh, Nicolas Cage and Holly Hunter, who you can see here in the picture, uh, wearing her official Tempe Police uniform, patch, and badge. That's the real deal that she's got on there. Um, so the Tempe Police, they really participated in the making of this film. Uh, uh, they allowed the crew to come into their police headquarters in downtown Tempe on 5th Street, and they shot scenes in there. And they also lent out police cars and uniforms to use uh, throughout the, the filming of the whole movie. Um, I have talked to some uh, uh, longtime members of the police force about what that was like. And from what I understand, uh, at the end of it all, they, uh, they ended up not being completely happy with how it all worked out. And I, I guess part of that is because um, if you've seen the movie, there's a lot of chase scenes in it. And they took these police cars and they basically trashed them during the filming of the movie. And so when they returned the cars to the PD, they weren't in very good shape. Had to, had to have a lot of work. You know, they were doing donuts in the desert with them and everything. Uh, and then the other thing was that they uh, didn't really like the portrayal of the police department. It's sort of a comedy, it's slapstick. Uh, the police are kind of portrayed as being, you know, sort of, uh, sort of goofy and incompetent. And, um, and even Tempe in general is portrayed as being a pretty backwards place. It's a Coen Brothers movie, so it's, it's funny and dark and weird. Um, so at the end of the day, it, it ended up not being the, um, uh, the good PR, I think, that the police department was looking for. And they ended up uh, never participating at that level with a, uh, with a movie again. Um, but it's pretty fun. I love the movie. So uh, definitely check it out if you haven't. Well, and I was wondering if a lot of people put A for Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure because it's been in the news so much lately with Metro Center closing. Yeah, absolutely, with Metro Center closing and then with them making uh, actually a, a, a third uh, uh, a movie that should be coming out soon. So that'll be interesting to see uh, Bill yeah, and Ted. Uh, here, <laughs> so, but yeah, no, they, they, there was a lot of great filming locations uh, in Tempe um, right here close to the museum. But um, yeah, as far as I'm aware, not uh, no police uniforms in that one. <laughs> nope. All right, question six. What Tipe restaurant was among the first KFC franchises in the entire nation? So this is Harmon's Ranch. So uh, this place was on Apache Boulevard. Um, it was a very quirky family style restaurant. As you can see, it's a, a big red barn. If you went inside, there were wagon wheels hanging on the ceiling that were the chandeliers. Uh, and they were also known for keeping a live mountain lion on site to entertain the guests. So believe it or not, there was a mountain lion roaming around in this place. Um, I've never were, heard that. Oh my it's God. It's true. Oh, yeah. Mean, like what a horrible thing to be sitting there having <laughs> in your hand with a mountain lion just wandering by. 
you can see it in some of the some of the pictures. Sometimes in some of the old pictures of Hermans, you can see kind of like a, you can catch a glimpse of a little cage that they would keep it in sometimes. And sometimes they would put it right out front. It was like an attractor. So this mountain lion would stand by Apache Boulevard in this cage to get people to come in and, and eat at Hermans, you know. <laughs> so so weird, you know, like they don't they don't make them like this anymore, right? So. But, uh, but there were two of these places back in, you know, the early 1950s. The other one was actually in Salt Lake City, Utah. It was run by another branch of the, the Herman family. Um, and it was those Utah Hermans who, in 1952, uh, met a man by the name of Colonel Sanders who had a killer chicken recipe. And so they worked out a deal with him to take his chicken and put it on the menu at the two Hermans restaurants. They came up with the name Kentucky Fried Chicken to describe the product. Uh, on the menu, they just started describing it as being finger licking good. And Herman's even started putting it in buckets when they served it. And it became so popular that they eventually just started opening Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants. And that was the ultimate fate of the Herman's on Apache Boulevard is uh, it, it, it just got torn down and they built a regular old KFC there in its place. And that's what I remember as a kid growing up. There was always a Kentucky Fried Chicken right there on Apache Boulevard. But little did I know that that's where it all started. So at one point, I so I've got film footage of Legend City ah. that the Crandall family hadn't seen before. So I actually um, put it on DVD and flew up to Salt Lake City and took it to Lewis and sat there and watched it with him. But when I was in Salt Lake, I also took the opportunity to go to the original Harmons. Oh, my God. Is it and still there then? It is. So it is still there. And so it's like a quasi. They still have the sign. But then there's also a Colonel Sanders on it. Okay. But it's kind of like this shrine because you walk in, they have one of the Colonel's white suits with the black string tie. So... That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, from, from what I understand, it was really the Hermans who were the ones who developed the franchise. You know, it was, it was Colonel Sandler's recipe, but it was the Hermans who took it and, and, and made it go international. Yeah, very much so. So yet again, here we are, Arizona food history. That's right. Who knew? Indeed. All right. What nightclub star launched his solo career from JD's nightclub in Tempe? So a lot of you might be familiar with uh, Waylon Jennings' story. So um, he uh, was back in 1959 um, a, uh, a member of Buddy Holly's band um, and at the, the very last minute decided not to get on the airplane that ended up uh, crashing and killing Buddy Holly along with the, the Big Bop here and, uh, and Richie Valens. And so um, after very narrow, narrowly avoiding the day the music died, he moved to Arizona. Uh, to find different work. Uh, worked as radio DJ in Coolidge for a while before being hired on uh, at a new club that was being built um, in Tempe on Scottsdale Road um, near the riverbed uh, called JD's. Uh, so Waylon was hired on to be the house band. Uh, he, he put his band together. Uh, he played there basically seven nights a week and, and started to build the following and started to develop his sound and started to get notice from JD's. Um, he wrote in his autobiography that he uh, uh, had a very diverse audience there. He had students and professors coming over from ASU to see him. He also had the local cowboys coming to see him. And so to keep everybody happy, he played a little bit of country. He played some rock and roll. He mixed the styles together, did it in kind of a stripped down way, and really developed the sound uh, that he became known for. Um, and, you know, it, it got labeled as out, outlaw country later and became a big movement, especially in the 1970s with him and Willie Nelson and a bunch of others. Uh, but... Um, you know, but it's, it's, it's cool to think that there was a magical time in Tempe in about 1965 where any night of the week you could just go out to JD's and see Waylon Jennings perform live. Uh, just a few years after that, he was a big superstar. And so if any of you can see that sign, and you might think it looks an awful lot like Mr. Lucky's. Right. Um, it indeed does because Glenn Guyette, the guy who painted my jacket, also designed Mr. Lucky's and JD's. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, wow. So that was one of his signs. Marshall, so, that's cool. The J and the D had those twinkle lights, and that was really a Glenn thing that he brought with him from Kansas City. It's a, it's a gorgeous sign. I mean, I, I, I so wish we still had it. It's, it's oh, I do as well. I wish we still had that sign. Yes. All right. Question eight. What was the name of the Tempe Barrio that was once located in the area where Devil's where the Sun Devil Stadium is today. 
Yeah, so San Pablo, I want to uh, acknowledge the uh, early Hispanic residents of Tempe who did so much to uh, help establish the town and, and get us going and make us who we are today. Um, but uh, San Pablo uh, was the name of uh, the neighborhood where many of, uh, of them lived. Um, it was a, a barrio that was along the southern edge of uh, Tempe Butte. You can see in the picture just a, a small portion of it looking down from the butte uh, onto some of the residences in the neighborhood. Uh, but it was a true barrio with, um, with adobe buildings as well as various shops and built businesses that were in there. Um, families lived there for many generations and um, it lasted from its founding, which would have been in the early 1870s all the way into the 1950s. Uh, that's when the neighborhood kind of came to a sad end. Uh, ASU acquired the entire neighborhood through eminent domain. Um, the families were moved out basically against their will, and uh, the land was used to develop Sun Devil Stadium and some of the sports complexes and, and residence halls, basically what's there now. Um, today, there's um, still a residence hall called San Pablo Residence Hall, so the name carried over to one of the residence halls. Oh. And yeah, yeah, that's still there. It's still there in the in the in the in the former uh, San Pablo Barrio neighborhood, and then the um, the Catholic church that, that's right there on University Drive and College, I guess. Um, the old St. Mary's or Mount Carmel Church um, is still there. That's, that's very much associated with uh, the San Pablo neighborhood. It was those residents who founded uh, this, uh, this early Catholic church in Tempe. So, so we still have that, which is great. Uh, a lot of the families are still here. A lot of them moved and relocated. Uh, many went to the uh, Victory Acres neighborhood in Tempe and, and, and live there still now. Um, but a lot of them are still very active in the community uh, from the old, um, you know, but, but still connect to the old San Pablo days. Wow. I mean, it's so interesting that even in the 50s, they were, I mean, it's like usually you think that kind of like almost like relocation happened later. So that was kind of early. Yeah, that's right. Well, it was it was it was growing so fast. I mean, that was that was sort of the beginning of the of the growth boom uh, for ASU for sure. ASU was growing yeah. like crazy, and, and it's not the only neighborhood that you know ASU ended up sort of taking over and making making into into campus. There were a lot of other residential neighborhoods kind of bringing the small campus that sort of were were kind of taken over as the as the campus expanded. Um, so there were there were whole neighborhoods that that sort of you know were there previously to ASU being there, uh, but but Tempe was growing like uh, like mad too it was uh, was growing south like crazy so um yeah yeah it was the time of time of a big boom big yeah. growth boom yeah indeed all right coming into the home stretch oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> what tippy attraction was the first of its kind in the u.s and the world yeah, i think you're right marshall i'm pretty sure that it was the first of its kind in the world uh big surf was the uh, uh the first recreational wave pool uh, this is where the technology uh, was developed, uh, so much so that um, Big Surf has been given a um, uh, it's been given a historic engineering landmark status because uh, that technology of making artificial waves was developed right here. Um, but it opened in 1969, and it really was uh, designed as a as a surf park. You know, it, it's big, so you can have a long surf run, and, and the waves are big. The waves are bigger than any other wave pool I've ever been to, and they roll all the way down, so you can catch the wave and and, and ride it. Um, but yeah, when this place opened, it was weird. You know, like nobody had ever seen this before. People thought it was bizarre to have an artificial ocean in the middle of Arizona. It made national news, it was in Time Magazine, it was in Sports Illustrated, people thought it was crazy. Um, but look at it now, wave pools are a very common thing, you see them everywhere, you know? Uh, but really this started here. Um, it's also pretty fun to think that when it was first built, they actually used real sand. So they had a real sand beach and sand underneath all the water, you know? And uh, eventually they replaced that all with concrete. Um, just because of maintenance and stuff like that. But, uh, but back in the early days, you would go and you would sit on a real sand beach and have the waves roll in at Big Surf. Oh, I had no idea that it wasn't sand. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize it was concrete. Yeah, it is now. It is now. So, so if you if you look at the early you know films and, and, and things, you can tell that they had a sand beach. But at some point, they removed that, and it's more of kind of a standard concrete wave pool now than sort of an artificial beach like it, it was originally intended. Now I remember um, when they first opened up to get that initial kind of money to help open it, it was used in a hairspray commercial. Yes, it was. Let me think if I can get this right. I believe it was the Clairol company. And it was, it was Clairol. Yeah. yeah they, they were like an initial big investor or possibly an owner 
um, when, when it first started, you know, so it was really, um, uh, they really branched out and did something different from the normal hair care products. And they built this bizarro thing out in the desert here. And I keep looking for, hopefully somebody at some point will up on YouTube will pop that commercial. I would love to see it. Yes. I would love to see it. I'm like, I can only imagine the height of the hair. <laughs> you got to show off the strength of the hairspray, right? You got to, you got to go up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. And then our last question, what is the name of the largest, that was the name of the largest video game arcade in Tempe in the eighties? Yeah, so if, if anybody out there grew up in Tempe in the early 80s, they probably remember Starship Fantasy. Um, there were lots of arcades in Tempe at the time, but Starship Fantasy uh, was the granddaddy of them all. Um, they had over 150 uh, coin-operated games. Uh, the whole place was space-themed. You would walk in and there were black lights. There were stars painted on the ceiling. They had models of spaceships hanging from the ceiling. So you, it's like you were, you were in outer space. And my understanding is that the employees even wore some kind of like a, like a spaceman like garb, you know, like maybe like Star Trek or something. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, uh, gosh, I can't believe they went that full into they, the team. They did. And that's what set them apart. You know, like, um, Arcades were a, they, they were, they were a boom. It happened fast. You know, video games were a trend that started to come out and in the very early 80s. Uh, they were very profitable and people just started opening up arcades like crazy all over the place. But usually it was just, you know, kind of an empty storefront. They would put the machines in, put a, a change maker in there and they would call it a day. So Starship Fantasy took it a step further by making it more of a themed experience uh, when you went in there and it really paid off. This was, this was the place to be in, you know, 1982, if you were a high school student in Tempe, you were here. <laughs> this is where you're. This is where you're spending your money. So. Now it did. It didn't last past the '80s. You know, like uh, like all all booms. The video game boom did bust. You know, that the market oversaturated, and a lot of these arcades couldn't make it, and they, they closed down. And so so Starship Fantasy isn't there anymore. But but it was just down the street from where I am now. It was just on on Baseline Road near Rural, and. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I moved here myself right after it closed. So it's a shame. I never got a chance to go myself. But uh, if I could go back in time, that's where I would be. But, you know, I wanted to bring up um, this video game history because one of the projects that I've been working on is a, a new featured exhibit that we have here at the Tempe History Museum called Video Invaders. And it's, a, uh, it's an exhibit all about the history of video games uh, and arcades in Tempe and uh, consoles like Pong and Atari and uh, some of the old computers. Um, it's, it's really a lot of fun. And so we've got this exhibit built and it's ready. And so as soon as we're able to uh, open our doors, we're gonna premiere this great exhibit called Video Invaders. And uh, a lot of the games are gonna be live. We've built a mini arcade. We've set all the games to free play. So you're gonna oh be able to come God. here. <laughs> yep. We've made a mini Starship Fantasy. We've even put black lights in it. So you're going to be able to come here, go into Starship Fantasy, and play Miss Pac-Man on free play. So that's what you have to look forward to when the Tempe History Museum opens oh, its doors. Oh I'm yeah. already thinking, what am I going to wear? <laughs> oh, my God. I went in there with a white shirt the other day, and I glowed. It was, it was incredible. <laughs> I can only imagine. Wow. Maybe your black velvet jacket that you're having made it would look awesome. Oh, that would be lighting. really yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's going to be really cool. I mean, we're, we're really excited about it. So, uh, yeah, just as soon as we can, we're going to be debuting this to the public. That, I know, whenever that is. Oh, my whenever God. Whenever that is. Yeah, yeah. So, but we can wait. You know, we've got it made. And, you know, whenever it's safe and makes sense to do so, it'll be here for you. So now what are you guys doing virtually? Uh, so we're doing a variety of virtual programs. I mean, the main thing that we're doing right now is a, um, uh, we do a kids program every summer called a Tempe Time Machine. Um, usually it's an in-person program, but this year we've put it all online and we've actually themed it towards video game history to go along with this new exhibit that we've been building. Um, so it's actually a lot of fun. You can find it on our website. Um, every Wednesday, we uh, post new content um, about video game history. 
Uh, there's, uh, there's game demos you can play. Um, there's coloring pages, there's activities, there's crafts. It's actually great for both um, kids and adults who are feeling nostalgic for the old games that they used to play with, you know. So that's what we have going on right now. And then uh, we're looking in the next uh, couple of months to uh, start doing uh, streaming evening programs. Uh, we have a very popular concert series that we normally do that we start in the fall. Uh, that we're looking at putting that online and having streaming concerts um, produced for our oh. wall. So we're excited about that. Yeah, having some of our great local bands come and, and perform and for you to be able to watch it from home. Um, and then we're also looking to do um, uh, a, uh, a, a more of a, a presentation slash community talk series where we uh, get people from the community to come and, and, and share whatever it is they do. So um, uh, so we'll be streaming all this stuff for free and uh, we'll be uh, getting by that way until we can start doing in-person events again. And, and then, like I said, I mean, the other way that you can really engage with us is um, going to our website and finding our online collection where you can keyword search 50,000 photographs of Tempe, you know. Uh, you're showing that uh, that Googie's ashtray. You can go in and you can search Googie's in our database and you can find some old pictures of the Tempe Googie's in there. So I encourage everybody to check that out. And then uh, the last part is that we do stay very active on Facebook. We have a really cool Facebook page where we're always posting great historic photographs, getting lots of comments from the public, some awesome conversations and memories that are always being shared every day on the Facebook page. So uh, check that out as well. Great. Well, yeah, no, I love the fact that a lot of museums are kind of really stepping up their game and really starting to do more virtually since people can't get there. Yeah, in a way, it's been uh, it's been kind of good for us to, to learn how to do this. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of brought us into the 21st century and we're learning a new way to deliver content. And I don't think it's going to go away. This is something that we can keep on doing uh, no matter what in the future is just a way to reach more people. It's good. Right, but now we've got to find somebody who actually worked at Starship Fantasy to come in during your Storyteller series and talk about that, because that would be fascinating. I would love that, yes. I would love to hear stories from Starship Fantasy, absolutely. Oh my gosh, and maybe they still have a costume. So, <laughs> a costume or maybe one of the ships that hung from the ceiling. <gasps> oh my gosh. imagine? God. Yeah. Oh, okay, so good. another rabbit hole to go down. Thanks, Josh. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we do right <laughs> that's exactly what we do hello rabbit hole jump <laughs> going down yep, there goes the day <laughs> yeah exactly all right well thank you so much for being on this evening absolutely it's been so much fun and you know what thank you for all that you're doing to promote history in arizona marshall you're doing great oh, work my pleasure have a great rest of your evening josh yeah same view all right i'm gonna go have a have one of those cocktails <laughs> <laughs> sounds good <laughs> bye bye Wow, that was, re it's like, oh my gosh, you know, that's the fun of doing this is because you never quite know what's going to happen, the stories that come out. So, so our next segment is called Little Arizona. And so, and because it was like, you know, I figured trying to do Little Arizona kind of Tempe related or not. And so decided to do Twin Buttes, which is a little town in Pima debating on whether it's a ghost town or not because it recent so it has about 900 people and last census it jumped up about 40 percent and so twin buttes was originally started it's about 20 miles south of tucson out in the on the eastern side of the mountains and it was really named for a mountain nearby and it was really a mining town that was found back in 1903. And it closed down about around 1930. And what I thought was interesting was there's a cemetery there that you really might not even be able to see except for there's a sign there, but most of the cemetery is actually under layers and layers of debris from the mine. And because the mine is actually owned by the mining company still, I think it was a different Twin Buttes. That was actually the fun of this was Arizona has a variety of cities that come up when you're doing Twin, Pute, twin Buttes. And so it was kind of fun trying to filter through and like looking, going to say, okay, which town is this? Oh, nope, that's this one, not this one. So 
kind of playing a little bit on the whole Tempe thing. And so there's what the mine looks like today. Now it really, and it's, I'm intrigued, you know, in a different era and a different time, I would have just hopped in my car and gone to Twin Buttes to see what it looks like and kind of the area around it, because with this huge growth recently, would love to see what's going on with what would have been historically a ghost town that may not be a ghost town. Or there might not be much of a town at all, because I have a feeling a lot of it's probably gone as part of the mine as well as like the cemetery that is just buried. And I have a feeling if there is anything left from the town, it's probably buried just like so much around it. And so here we have some of the original, an original photo from back when it was a mine back in the early 1900s. And there's a little bit from the cemetery. It seems to be that those are the only two images I actually could find of graves that actually looked like grave sites. Everything else just looks like what you see there in the distance. That's pretty much what the whole area looks like. Now, remember always, if you have any questions, suggestions, or stories you would like to see featured, let me know because that's part of the fun of this is sometimes people say, hey, you know, what about this? And then it gives me another rabbit hole to go down because, you know, you never have enough of those. Or if you have comments on how you think the show could be better, please let me know, completely open suggestions. Now, because it is this coming Friday is third Saturday, we have Virtual Arizona Pride and they have been doing third Saturday events. And so this Saturday I'm actually doing at three o'clock, we are gonna be doing a transgender history of Arizona that I'm still in the throes of putting together, but it's going to be a lot of fun finding some really cool facts. It actually started off as um, a display that we did with the Arizona Historical Society and have been kind of pushing around the state a little bit. And so in this time, there's no events happening. And so it's a way to continue that history as well as that sharing with the whole goal of getting other stories back and other realia and ephemera. So that's exactly where I will be at three o'clock on Saturday. You can find it right here on Marshall Shore Hip Historian on Facebook. It'll also show up on YouTube as well as Twitch. So if you would like to reach out, you can reach out via Facebook, Marshall Shore Hip Historian, or you can throw me an email at hello at hiphistorian.com. And remember, it wouldn't happen without you all helping support it. And there's my Venvo. And, you know, I realize, Gloria, that I didn't send you anything for my Zelle. I will do that this evening because I'm not quite sure what I even need to pass on. But we will get that corrected. So, again, thank you all so much for being here. Now, next week we have Joseph um, from the Arizona Citizens for the Arts. So it's going to be a really fun show for that. Oh, my gosh. I know he's been doing a – before all this hit, he was doing a lot of traveling around Arizona talking about the arts. So very excited for that. And so again, thank you all so much for being here. Now we are sponsored right now by ARP of Arizona. And so the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we're not alone. ARP is here in Arizona providing information that can help you and your family. For information and resources, please log on to their website, which is www.aarp.org slash AZ. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, I will see you here, same bat time, same bat channel, as we get a chance to talk to Joseph about who knows what. So have a great rest of your evening all, and good night.